Father in heaven, God, thank you, Lord, that we are here to worship you. Thank you that we can do this freely. Lord, thank you that you're the one that never leaves the one behind. Such a powerful verse in that song. God, I just, I just say that uh, for all of us here, Lord, be preparing our hearts. Here's our heart, Lord. Father, and we pray you speak truth. We are ready, God, to be transformed so that we can go out into this world and trans- transform others. In Jesus' name we pray these things. Amen. We're going to be in uh, 1 John chapter 4. We're going to look at verses 7 through 19. So if you can get there and then we'll get rolling. I get the privilege of talking about of twice now. This is my second time that we had a 9 o'clock gathering, and I love talking about love. So last week when Rick, uh, not last week, but a couple weeks ago, Rick talked about love. He talked about the, the love amongst the church, fellowship with each other. He said that, uh, if you were paying attention, he said that love is a thermometer of our spiritual health. You guys remember that? Love is the thermometer of our spiritual health. We can gauge by how much we show this love. John continues this theme in chapter 4. Uh, he, he's talking about what this true love is, but he's switching the focus now from loving one another, this fellowship of loving one another, to really the nature of God and about the love that God shows us, shows his creation. Some good questions to ask when you're, when you're reading passages that seem to have this type of reoccurring theme is, why does the author feel like he needs to repeat himself? Okay, what is the point that he's trying to address here with talking about love again? It, it seems like you already, it seemed like he already got it covered, John, at the beginning, at chapter 3, uh, and he's bringing it up again. Here's some, here's some good things to, to keep in mind. When you're reading God's Word and, and you see a repetition of things that the, the writer is trying to emphasize, he's trying to say this is really important. If God saw it to have it in there more than twice, what do you think that means for us? Means, means we better be paying attention, right? This is important stuff because God is, is letting us know, hey, I'm gonna, it, it, it's worth saying twice, so get it in your heart. So that's why, that's why we're talking about love again. Um, let's go into it. Let's start right into it. Let's go to verse 7 right here in chapter 4. And he says, Dear friends, let us love one another because love is from God. Everyone has been born of God and knows God. The one who does not love does not know God, because God is love. Let's stop right there for a minute. So here, John, again, he's saying, look, if, if you love one another, uh, it's because this love comes from God. Okay, he's kind of repeating what he's already talked about. And much of what we think about love is often more from a selfish desire. All right, it's, uh, so it's really important for us to, to be able to pick what, what this love, this true love that God is speaking of here, and then the love that we sometimes view, the, the world's love, sometimes how we view love personally. Uh, sometimes we, we look at this love and it's more of a, about feeling, how I feel about a person. Even though that sometimes that type of love can come and go, doesn't it? It can, it can come and go, that love. Oftentimes this love is, is uh, what we can get from another person. If you love me this way, then I will love you back. You know, we put conditions on the love. If you don't love me the way I want you to love me, then I'm going to exchange your love for something or someone else that can give me that love. It, what, what it does is that it puts pressure on the other person. And all it does, is it, it, ends in, it ends in failure, it ends in pain, in destruction, uh, and, and it's a counterfeit type of love. It's not truly real. And, but God's love is different. It's way different. It's not surface level. It's not physical. It has nothing to deal with uh, 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 what we often think about love, maybe on a sexual or romantic level. This is not the type of love that we're going to be talking about. It's grander. It's bigger than that. And God, uh, he can love us this way because it's in his nature when it says that God is love. Just like how God is holy and just, God is love as well. Listen to what C.S. Lewis says about God's love. Though our feelings come and go, God's love for us does not. And many of you know 
If you've been in church long enough, you know that the New Testament was written in Greek. Yep, written in Greek. And uh, so John is talking about when he uses the word love, he's using different forms of this love, this agape love, different forms of that. And he's, he's trying to get us to understand the differences between this, because when we read this, we just see the word love, love, love in English. But in the Greek, it's got a lot more meaning, you know, versus uh, if it's God's love or more of a love of action. And he says, he's got two forms. He uses the word, uh, when, he, when he talks about this love that we show, it's more of a, it's a different type of agape, the agapao if you would. That's, that's that verb form versus the agape of, of this grand love that God has shown us. It's undeserved. Listen to what 1 John 3.18, because he uses this, this agapo, this uh, verb, this action love. It says, dear children, let us not merely say that we love each other, but let us show the truth by our action. You know what John is saying here? He's saying, guess what? Uh, th- this, uh, this talk, this, he's pretty much saying that talk is cheap, all right? Talk is cheap, but, but you need to be able to put this into action, all right? You need to be able to put this into action, putting others' needs above you. He said, instead, let's show people this love, this love that's actually doing something instead of just saying that we're going to do something. This love is in action because of why why well he answers the question for us he says let us show this love in action by truth that truth is what that truth is the agape love the the love that god has shown us the sacrificial love that he shows us that we can give to others but god has given it to us loving the un the loving the unlovable forgiving the unforgivable god's agape love was manifested to us in so many different ways. Uh, from the very beginning of creation, think about creation. Okay, God made everything. It seemed like he made everything with, with us in mind, didn't he? The way we're positioned away from the sun, just to write them out so that life can occur here on this planet, the, the, the different uh, atmospheres that we have. The fact that the way our bodies work and able to be able to breathe the air, how, how the, the intricate, complex uh, organisms that we have. It's like when we look out into the world, it's like, man, God, God had us in mind when he made all of this, okay? God's love shouts through all of his creation, but it's not heard audibly, but we can see it just by looking around at the nature around us. Let's look at Psalm 19. It talks about this very thing. Verses 1 through 4. The heavens declare the glory of God, and the sky proclaims the work of His hands. Day after day they pour out speech. Night after night they communicate knowledge. There is no speech. There are no words. Their voice is not heard. Their message has gone out to all the earth, and their words to the ends of the earth. We look outside, we have beautiful sunsets and sunrises here on the Outer Banks, don't we? And we have the beautiful ocean for the light to reflect off of. You know, you look at that. I'll tell you a story. One of the guys that I work with, I do, um, I do hardwood floor also as, another, as uh, my part-time job. And uh, we were working on the house by the beach. And we, I, I looked out in the ocean, and, you know, the, the, the light was coming down. And you know how it just kind of glistens off of the off of the waves in the ocean really beautiful and it was a nice warm day and he looked at it uh, i think we were working at the pier that's where we were we were at nags head pier putting in a new floor um so you guys are gonna have a nice brand new floor if you go to eat at nags head pier and um and so he's he's walking out and he stops for a minute i said man look at that and he looks out and he says he says you know what he said i uh, i know I'm, I'm not a whole lot about I'm not really religious, or I don't talk a whole lot about God. He said, but there's got to be a creator by looking at that. He said, there's got to be a creator by how beautiful that is. You know, and it's just, and here's God, he's just, God is just witnessing through his creation. It's just awesome. It's a really, really cool thing. The fact that God chose to create the world shows that he had us in mind. I already told you that. He doesn't need us, though, okay? He doesn't need us. God wasn't lonely. He wasn't saying, oh, man, I... I, I got to have I got to have people to talk to. I'm getting lonely. No, God didn't need us 
but he created us because he loves. He created us uh, so that we can enjoy this. He created us for worship. Paul addressed this as he was speaking to the Athenians in chapter 17 of Acts. They were, uh, all the philosophers and all the, the smart people of the day, they were all gathered together and they were in this area where they had all these different altars for different gods. And they had this one altar that said for the unknown God, because the Athenians, they didn't want to, they didn't want to leave a God out. You know, they didn't, they didn't want to, they didn't want to make anybody mad. And it sounds a lot like our culture, right? They make sure they didn't leave anybody out so they don't offend anybody. They didn't want to offend this unknown God. So here Paul says, look, talking about, talking about this creation, he says, look, he is the God who made the world and everything in it. Since he is the Lord of heaven and earth, he doesn't live in man-made temples. And human hands can't serve his needs, for he has no needs. He himself gives life and breath to everything, and he satisfies every need. That last part of the verse is so true, because we are dependent on God. He is not dependent on us. We are, when something goes bad, we, we cry, oh, God. You know, because we are dependent on God, whether we realize it or not. He's not, he's not down. He's not looking at us saying, man, look at, look at, look at what George is doing. Gosh, I, I, I I could really use some of that. I really needed that, George. Awesome. You know, but you, you know what it really is? We're looking up and saying, God, I really need you. I can't do this um, without you. And it's awesome that he's made a way for us to be able to talk to him, to be able to be with him. Perhaps the greatest love that God ever showed us was that he would make that one and only way for us to have a relationship with him, and that is through Jesus Let's look at verses 9 through 11. He says, God's love was revealed among us in this way. God sent his one and only son into the world so that we might live through him. Love consists in this, not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. That's a hard word there. I struggle with pronunciation, for the pronunciating that word. That's a big church word there, and we'll go over that as well. Dear friends, if God loved us in this way, we also must love one another. We'll stop right there. So in this verse, John gives us a definition of God's agape love. You want to know what agape means? You want to know what the true love of God is? He's got it defined right here. He's in verse 10. He says, love consists in this, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his only son to be the sacrifice for our sins, to be the payment for our sins, to take our place for our sins. That's what that, that big fancy word that is hard to pronounce means. He took our place. He made the way for us. And again, the, the Greek has so much more meaning and makes it so much a more powerful verse because John here, he says, if we break down this verse 10, he says, love consists of this. He uses the form of, Agape. He's, he's, he says, agape consists of this. This godly love, this sacrificial love that you can't give, but God has given you, consists of this. All right? That love that forgives the unforgivable. We talked about that grace undeserved. Then John goes to use the other form, the form and action of agape. Not that we loved God, saying, not that we showed anything. We didn't demonstrate. We didn't go and we didn't show our love in action to God. But, using that same form, referring to more showing the action, but God showed us that love. We didn't show it, but God said, I'm going to show you what true love is. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be that agape love for you. I'm going to show you that. We didn't love God, plain and simple. We did not love God. But verse 10 ends in such a beautiful way that he loved us. He demonstrated that for us. Our God is a God of action, isn't he? Amen? Our God is a God of action. He didn't create and sit back and just say, have at it. Go. Love, because we can't love, can't truly love without first knowing what true love is. Our God is a God of action. Jesus became our payment for our sin. He satisfied that sin debt 
That's what it means, this true love. And God accepted that once and for all. Listen to what Jesus, when he spoke about this very thing to his disciples, John 15, 13, it says, No one has greater love than this, that someone would lay down his life for his friend. I love how the message translation puts it. It says that this is the very best way to love, church. This is the very best way to love. Put your life on the line for your friends. Put your life on the line for your friends. Sacrifice your time. Sacrifice whatever you've got to to put your line on your life on the line for your friends. What does that look like? How can we do that? We, we, John told us this is what, what God is love means. Now, now that we know he's told us what this true love is, he issues us a challenge in verse 11. If you look at verse 11, that is the challenge. I'm going to read that to you guys once again. It says, Dear friends, if God loved us in this way, we also must love one another. I think a better way to to look at this verse, if we, if we take that if out and put since, since God loved us in this way, we should love one another in the same way, right? How can we meet that challenge, though, that John has issues? How, church, how can we meet that challenge? First off, God has already given us what we need. God has already given us who we need in order to be able to love like Christ loved, the Holy Spirit. Listen to what Jesus says here in John 14. But the Holy Spirit will come and help you because the Father will send the Spirit to take my place. The Spirit will teach you everything and will remind you of what I said while I was with you. The Holy Spirit is going to remind us of this great love that Jesus has shown us. To remind us to be able to do what Jesus did on earth. He said, look, you guys can love like I love. You can do this. Believers, If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, guess what? You have the Holy Spirit living in you. So I know some of you are like, well, I can't can't really love like that. I say, yes, you can. Jesus said it. We can can do this. He had compassion on those that the world looked down upon. He, He forgave those that received no forgiveness. He loved those that were cast aside in society who were seemingly unlovable to the world. Remember the story of the woman that was caught in adultery? You guys remember that story? It's a, it's, a, it's a crazy story, but I love the powerful message that it has. So the Jewish leaders, they catch this woman in the, in the act of adultery, red-handed. They're like, oh, look, Jesus, we got this woman. She is sleeping around. That's not her husband. Um, we caught her. Here she is. Then the law says, the law says that she needs to be killed for what she's done. She needs to be stoned until she is dead. Now, what do you say? Jesus, they were trying to trap him. They are trying to get him to say something wrong. And Jesus, he just kind of starts writing in the sand, just kind of real calm, you know, and then he, then he uh, looks at the, these Jewish religious leaders and he says, all right, hurl the stones at her until she dies then. But only he who's never sinned may throw the first stone. And he stooped down, he started writing some more, and, and then the Jewish leaders, they started to slip away one by one from the oldest to the youngest. And all that was left was Jesus and this woman in front of this crowd, you know. And so then Jesus stands up. He looks at this woman. You know she's got to be terrified. She was almost getting ready to be killed, right? I mean, you'd be terrified too if you knew that you were, you were this close to dying. And you know she's just shaking and trembling. And Jesus stands up and he says, where are your accusers? Where are your accusers? Didn't even one of them condemn you? No, not one of them. And she look, you know, she just looks up and she goes, "No, sir, not one condemned me. Not nobody accused me." And Jesus said, "Neither do I. I don't condemn you either. Go and sin no more." We often forget that God has shown us so much love. This type of love of forgiveness. We're all broken, so we all need to be loved as God loves. And it's a good reminder too, I, I, to, I shared this with the last gathering, this wasn't in my notes, but sometimes, sometimes love, a godly love, means you have to call out somebody within the body now. It's not, uh, it's not for us to judge those outside of the church. But Jesus here, look, he showed this woman grace, right? He said, look, I don't accuse you either. I don't condemn you for what you did, but... You're forgiven, but don't do this thing anymore. 
Don't go and sin no more. So church, listen to me, church, within our body of believers, sometimes loving like Jesus means you have to have a tough conversation with each other. God has called us to protect one another, to encourage one another. And if somebody within the body is struggling with sin and we just let them go and kind of put it out of our mind and just be like, I'm not going to really deal with that. How much do you really love them? Do you love them enough for them to, for, to allow them to destroy their life? And that, that's convicting to me. Do we love them enough to speak up and say, I see this thing, this wrong that you're doing in your life. Can I help you? That's love. That's true love, not, not uh, stepping back and saying, I'm not the pastor. That's not my problem. Doesn't say that, the, that that's the pastor's job. So look in scripture and see if that's the pastor's job. It's not. It's our job to keep each other accountable. That is true love. Loving like Jesus means you don't look at their sins. You don't look at the sins of the people on the outside, but you look at them as God created them in his image. This is something that I do every morning on a regular basis. Every morning before I go to work, before I leave my house, even in my own home, because my wife and my kids, they're created in the image of God. Okay, so what I do, and, and to keep this in the forefront of my mind, is God, the people that I'm going to meet today, the people that I'm going to speak with today, I need to be able to look at them like you do. I don't, I don't see their, uh, their shortcomings. I don't see what's wrong with them, but I see that they are created in the image of God just like I am. And that's the only thing we need to keep in mind because from that, this type of love will stem out from us. You guys understand that? If we start viewing people, because listen, listen, if, if the word of God says that he knows every hair on our head, not just our heads, but those, those are the, uh, the people that are not believers and all their days are numbered in his book and they're still alive, guess what? God is, still has a purpose for their life. They're not dead. They're still alive. We need to help them find that purpose. And it starts, it starts with us looking at them in love and looking at them and seeing them as here is somebody created just like I am, except I'm a sinner saved by grace. They've yet come to that point. How can I love them so that they can understand what it truly means to be created in his image? David wrote this. Uh, he talked about this very thing in Psalm 139, 14. Beautiful verse. Thank you for making me so wonderfully complex. Your workmanship is marvelous. It's not talking about the church. It's not talking about believers in God. He's talking about people, everybody. Your workmanship is marvelous. Church, when we wake up in the morning and head out into the world, here's what we need to do. I know I said it once, but I'm going to say it a different way. We don't, we need to quit looking at people's faults, faults, the things that are wrong with them, and start looking at them as David wrote here. We look at them and say, I'm, I'm, I'm going to marvel at this creation that God has placed before me today. Even within your own home, when your child is being a brat. I know I got a six-year-old and an eight-year-old. Sometimes they drive me nuts. Sometimes they drive my family nuts. But I look, I look at them and everybody else on the outside and, and, I mar and, and, I, and I need to quit looking at their faults and say, God, look at this beautiful workmanship that you've made here. I marvel at this creation that you've brought into my life, by the way, because there's no coincidences. There's no coincidences. God has placed people in our lives for a purpose. All right? Let's look at verse 12. No one has ever seen God. If we love one another, God remains in us and his love is perfected in us. This ties in perfectly with what we just talked about. Jesus said in John 13, if you love one another, everyone will know you are my disciple. Get this, church, if you don't get anything else today. Get this. You may be the only Jesus a person may ever see. That's what it means when it says no one has ever seen God. It's true. No one has ever seen God. But you know how they can see Jesus? 
They can see by what you say, by how you act in front of them, by how you talk with them, by how you interact with them. You, you, you really want them to see Jesus? Then show them Jesus. Let's go and show them the love of Christ that we know is truth. Let's show them that. You know what else is another way that God shows us love? And, and this, this might, might throw you off. Another way that God has shown us love, church, is that he would leave us here on earth. You're probably thinking, I don't want God to love me like that. I want to be in heaven already, right? You'd be like, I want to be in heaven already. I, there's many times in my life where I've been like, uh, God, I wish you would have just taken me on home the moment I believe because I'm going through a lot of struggles. I'm going through a lot of rough stuff, and I don't want to deal with it. I don't want to deal with it anymore. It's hard. Right? We're all dealing with, with some messy, messy stuff. But here's how God shows us love through this, okay? He left us here because we've been given the greatest privilege on earth than anything else. The greatest pr privilege is that we get to spread the message. We get to tell the message on how a person can move from eternal separation from God to eternal life with God. That's why we're here. That's love. If, if we all just went off to heaven, who's going who's gonna to carry the message? Right? He's equipped us to do it, right? We have the Holy Spirit. He's equipped us to do this thing. As a privilege, understand, church, we have such a huge privilege and we often forget i'm saved uh i'm just going to live my life but we often forget that god has said man look look what you get to do you church me we get to be miracle workers do you guys understand that we get to perform miracles i'm not talking about some crazy stuff like i'm going to part the water right here in this baptism on step in it i'm talking about the miracle of being able to tell people about the message of Jesus, and the miracle is that they can have eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. That's the miracle. That's the privilege that we have. That is true love. Let's look at verse 13. We're going to go all the way through 16. This is how we know that we remain in him and he in us. He has given us assurance to us from his spirit, and we have seen and we testify that the Father has sent his Son as the world's Savior. Whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, God remains in him, and he in God. And we have come to know and to believe the love that God has for us. God is love, and the one who remains in love remains in God, and God remains in him. These verses tie perfectly in with what Pastor Rick talked about last week. Last week, we were in the beginning of, of this chapter 4 talking about false teachers, and this ties perfectly with that, because he says, look, you're going to know, you're going to know for sure who the Holy Spirit is, and he's going to remind you of this truth, of this love of God, and he says, what is that truth? That the Son of God is Jesus, and he is the world's Savior, and, if, and that's how we can test the spirits, talking about last week, because the false spirits, they're going to say something that looks like Jesus, maybe acts like Jesus, but isn't Jesus. We can be 100% sure that what we're seeing here is the truth. Let's go to 17. In this, in this, love is perfected with us so that we may have confidence in the day of judgment. For we, as, for we are as he is in the world. There's no fear in love. Instead, perfect love drives out fear because fear involves punishment. So the one who fears has not reached perfection in love. We love because he first loved us. John here, he's taking us to the future. He's letting us know. He says, look, you guys know 100% that you are saved. You believe this message that Jesus is the Son of God, that he is the Savior of the world. He says, do not let fear overtake you. There's no need to fear death, right, church? There's no need to fear death. And along with that, you know, what, you know what it, how that ties into love? We don't need to fear talking to people who need to hear about love because we're, we're, we're equipped 
to do that. There should not be any fear. I know it's scary sometimes to approach people and try to have a conversation about Jesus, to try and talk anything with church. Sometimes, some, some, sometimes like anxiety hits you when you just want to invite, when you, when you just say, hey, will you come to church with me? Even that can be really tough for some of y'all, am I right? Just the simple invitation. But we need to have this thought in our mind. All right, listen to this. 2 Corinthians 4.10, one of my favorite verses. And it ties in perfectly with what we were just talking about. We always carry around in our body the death of of Jesus, so that the life of Jesus may also be revealed in our body. We're a new creation, right, church? We are a new creation. So you know what that means? Let us, listen, let us reveal this new life of Jesus. Let us reveal this this Jesus living in us to those in the world by remembering, by remembering what he's done for us. Carrying around the death of Jesus in our body. If we can remember that, then we can show the world, we can reveal to the rest of the world this true love that Christ died for them too. Not just for us. That Christ died for them too. Here are some steps you can take. I'm going to encourage you guys to do this. If you want to learn to love people here within the body, The best way you can do that is by serving one another, serving in ministry. Because John is talking about loving people here and loving people outside. So I encourage you to sign up for the the 301 class. Take out your communication card, write your name, and say, I want to learn how to love in ministry. And then if if you want to learn to love people outside of here, we can equip you with that. You want to learn how to be on mission all the time, not not going overseas, but here. Showing people the Jesus that lives within you. And I encourage you to sign up for the 401 class. Take, Take that communication card, write your name, and just write 401. Learn to love in mission. And if you're here and you're saying, I don't, this is the first time I've ever hearing this stuff, Ramon, about Jesus, that he died for me. He's uh, sacred. He took my. He took my pain. He took the payment for my sin upon himself, and that I can know God. If you want to know more about that, I encourage you to take that communication card and write. I want to know more about Jesus. Or maybe you're saying, I want that now. I believe in Jesus now. Right on there. I'm trusting in Jesus as my Savior. I'm going to be up here. The other pastors are going to be up here, and you can come talk to us about this true love. Let's pray. God, I thank you so much for this day. I thank you for your love and your grace. Lord, thank you that we have the opportunity to change lives and that you want to use us, ordinary people who struggle just as much as anyone else. But you want us to demonstrate that love. You want us to demonstrate the life of Jesus living in us. Help us to reveal that to the world. As we continue our worship, Lord, may we sing knowing that you love us so much. May we sing out that love to you. In your name, amen.